Благорестная казака, у на Богу молилась, а за свободу, за народ, а резко поклонилась. Бойся ты, бойся, ты меня не бойся, я тебя не трону, а ты не беспокойся. Бойся ты, бойся, ты меня не бойся, я тебя не трону, а ты не беспокойся. Why is it they can go into your country with nothing and in like a hundred years you know they're like ruling over you what's like that why is it why, why can they do that and, and we just can't can't just seem to get our shit together and I would say there's nothing wrong with losing um, Losing, I think, for the most part, is a pretty good thing. I mean, as long as you learn from your mistakes. You see, your enemies are always teaching you, as long as you're listening. Right? There's that motto that God gave you two ears and one mouth because he wants you to listen twice as much as you speak. All right. So you have to listen to your enemies. It's very important. We're going to talk about, you know, probably the two greatest generals in history. Not the two greatest conquerors. You know, I think there's a difference between Alexander the Great, um, Julius Caesar, Cyrus the Great, these guys, versus the, the two generals we're going to talk about. And these are probably the two greatest generals in ancient history. I mean, Pompey's pretty good. Uh, Caesar's amazing. Alexander the Great. Like, these are... Con but Caesar, conqueror. Uh, Alexander, conqueror. We're going to talk about generals. Uh, and the two generals we're going to talk about, one from Carthage. And again, Carthage is a Phoenician... Uh, ca uh, colony, right? And it's a Hebrew word, Carthage, right? Carthage is the Latin uh, rendering of the Hebrew words Kiria Hadash. Okay, Kiria Hadash became Carthage, and uh, and then now we call it Carthage. And in Hebrew, it means new town, new borough. It's like the new place. It's the new place to move, right? It's a colony, and uh, it's Hebrew. Um, and like the Phoenicians again are it's the whole Levant there. So to say, um, I'm Phoenician, it could be Northern Israel. It's like, <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, I grew up, I spent most of my life in probably Southern Ontario uh, on the New York border, New York state, you know, my best friends from uh, one of my best friends is from, uh, Rochester, New York, and, uh, I lived in Niagara for, like, six, seven years, and, um, you know, me and this guy look like we're brothers or cousins, um, you know, we both have, like, blondy red hair, blue eyes, uh, we talk the same, we sound, there's no way you could tell me and my American buddy aren't from the same part of the world. Like, I'm Canadian, he's American. It was an invisible border that divided us. Uh, there's, there's just no way. Here where I live, I'm not Canadian here. I'm the American, right? And half the people in my village, half of them are my friends, the other half think I'm an American spy. And it doesn't matter if I say I'm Canadian. There's, in their heads, there's no difference between a Canadian and, and an American. And that's what I would say is the same between someone from Phoenicia, right, from Tyra, Sidon, or Baalbek, um, versus someone from northern Israel. They had the same gods, same religion, the most evil queen of Israel in the whole story of the Bible is a queen from Tyra, Sidon, named Jezebel. Okay, so the queen of Israel was from Phoenicia. 
right? She's the evilest queen in the in the history of Israel. And she was married to King Ahab. Okay? So anyways, this is very much an Israelite calling. The two generals I'm talking about, uh, one is the Roman general, Scipio Africanus. And... I think his first name was Cornelius. And he was named to Africanus because of his conquest of Africa. And he went against, arguably, arguably the greatest general who ever lived. Okay, and his name is Hannibal Barca. Okay, now what do we notice about the name Hannibal Barca? It's three Hebrew words. So the greatest general probably in history is a guy with the most Hebrew name you can imagine. Hannibal is made up of two words. One is Hananiah, right? This is where you get the name Hannah, Anna, right? Um, and it means grace, right? And his last, his next part of his name is Baal, Hani Baal, and Baal is Hebrew. Now, look, it's not necessarily a bad word, Baal. It's just a, a way to say a lesser lord, okay? Uh, in Hebrew to this day, a woman would call her husband Baal, okay? That means husband in Hebrew. And it just means Lord, Master, Boss. Um, and in the Bible, whenever you read that the Israelites stopped worshiping God and started to serve Baal, it's referencing Baal Hadad. It's referencing the God, Baal Hadad, okay? Hadad the Lord, the Lord Hadad, who was the Phoenician, the Canaanite, god right of fertility he was like the prime god of the canaanites Baal Hadad, right and there's also you know the female right Ash Ash ashtaroth ashtaroth um astarte there's different names for her and what you're going to notice is the gods of northern Israel, the gods of Canaan, are the same gods of Carthage. Rome's, one of Rome's greatest rivals. The Romans' greatest rival were the Gauls. That was their main, their main rival, but Carthage was also a serious rival. And it was when they conquered Carthage is when they're going to really come to world power. So, anyways... Hannibal Barca. Barca means lightning. Okay? And it, it's you look at the Hebrew word Barak. This is where you get Barca. So Hannibal Barca, Hananiah, Baal, Barak. Okay? Hananiah, grace, Lord, grace of the Lord, and then lightning. Okay? That's what Hannibal's name means in Hebrew. And... He was undefeated. So let's go back to the Punic Wars. Because what this is about, the Romans got slaughtered. The Romans lost, <laughs> like, all, like, they pretty much just kept losing. So how did these people, who just kept losing, how did they become the world power? How is it possible that when you lose you end up winning. Well, it's because as long as you're listening to your enemies, your enemies are teaching you how to beat them. Okay? And that's what we're going to learn through the Punic Wars. Okay, there was three Punic Wars. Okay, and they happened in the... Really, the probably started in the, the close to the mid third century BC actually so about this the same time the Septuagint Bible is being written 
um, about this time is when you have the first Punic War. So just kind of look at that as a marker. Is about the time the Septuagint was coming into existence that you have the first Punic War. And at this point, Carthage was just unbelievable. Na naval power like you wouldn't believe. And they and back then, like all you had, all the Carthaginians had to do was take their boats and ram them, smash them into the Roman boats. And the Roman boats would just sink. All their goods would be lost. Their men would be dead. That's it. So the Carthaginians had these giant ships. I think they were called... Uh, the Romans had triremes. And that means the Carthaginians had uh, kinkiremes. Which meant... All that means is tri, right? So the Romans had triremes. Three tri. Which, so they had... In their ships, they had three rows of rowers. Versus the Carthaginian ships, the, kin, the kinkiremes, which had five rows. King, right? The word, uh, it's like in, in French, sank. Um, and uh, five, so the Carthaginian ships were much more powerful. But what happened was... The Romans understood that they were losing, and their specialty was land warfare. They weren't used to naval warfare. And the Romans got really lucky, because they're like, we need to copy their ships. We need better ship models. So what ended up happening was, just uh, pure luck, the Romans got their hands on a couple wounded King Kareem's, and they were able to um, reverse engineer them. They started taking them apart. And what was crazy was when the Romans, when the Romans started taking these ships apart, what they noticed was the Carthaginians had instructions, instructions for, on, labeled on every part. What the Carthaginians were doing. They were mass producing these, like in a factory. Each, each, like, like pre, you could buy kits if you were, you know, they could ship these like, like a factory, like, like a, a pre-engineered, all you have to do is assemble them. And written on every part of the boat was a piece number and then instructions as to where it goes. So when the Romans were taking these boat, these uh, ships apart, uh, there, there was already instructions on them, so it was kind of like like IKEA or whatever. They would just Carthaginians would just sell you the kits, and you assemble the boat yourself. So, anyways, so now the Romans could do copy their ships. I'm pretty. I think the Romans were using um, a cheaper kind of wood that was heavier. So I think the Roman ships were slower, heavier, but the Romans also knew that these, the, the ships they were building, they weren't designed to last, right? They were designed to just be used in battle and then thrown away at the end. But then the Romans were smart because they knew, okay, well, we're strong on the land. They're strong on the water. How do we turn the tides? So, as the Romans are just getting slaughtered and slaughtered and slaughtered, they realize, you know what, we need to build a bridge, a ram, so that when the Carthaginians hit us, as they smash into us, this bridge is going to fall, and they call it a corvus, okay, which I think is like a beak, right, it's like, some, or the crow, the crow. Something like this. And the Corvus was... I'm just... This is just off my memory. Okay? Um, and... So this this bridge, this Corvus would fall. Um, I think it's the Crow or the Raven or something like this. And now what would happen is the ships would attach. So the moment that Carthaginian ship would smash into that Roman ship, this Corvus would fall, connect the two ships... 
So now whatever fate was bound for that Roman ship, that Carthaginian ship was now tied to it. All right. So the Corvus would fall. And the thing was, on the Carthaginian ships, they only had slave rowers, right? The Romans installed their boats with legionnaires, marines. This is like, uh, not the first world marines, but this is where, like, I'd say, like, the, like the true marines were born. Um, um, obviously, they existed with the Greeks. They existed before, but... I don't think like this. And so that Corvus would fall, connect the two boats, and then, a you know, 60 to 100 Roman legionnaires would jump onto the, the rival ship, the Carthaginian ship, that was just full of slaves and rowers. They didn't have soldiers on their ships. And the Romans would just jump all overboard, kill them all, and then take their ship. Right? So all of a sudden, the Romans through loss after loss after loss, studied their enemy, right? And learned from their mistakes and, and adapted, adapted to them to the point now where the enemy's strengths were now their greatest weakness. Their ships were no longer a tool to be used against the Romans, the Romans found a way to use their greatest tool against them. And they only were able to do that by loss after loss after loss. So as long as you're listening to your enemy, your enemy's always telling you how to beat them, right? That's the first Punic War. And Hannibal was a, I don't even know if Hannibal was born yet. He's probably born probably born uh, either at the beginning or halfway through. His father, though, his father, I think his name was Hasdrubal, and he was a general, very powerful general. I think he was stationed in, in uh, uh, Sicily, right? And uh, he was really pissed and bitter that his Carthaginian government surrendered, sued for peace, and Carthage ended up losing. Uh, like, they lost Sardinia, they lost parts of uh, Spain, they lost Sicily, the Carthaginians, they had to pay back a huge debt, an embarrassing, you know, like a Treaty of Versailles embarrassing, bill to pay for the war and Hannibal's father was pissed and apparently as the legend goes swore all his children to eternal hatred for Rome and they grew up always wanting a rematch to settle the score and what happened in the second Punic War I think now we're closer to 220 BC, I think 218 BC, sorry again, it's off the top of my head. And uh, there was some fighting over a, like a border city that was clearly in Car Carthaginian territory, but they wanted to be Roman. But the Romans, uh, they, were on, they, were, they were in Carthaginian territory. And uh, I think it was called Saguntum. And uh, Rome ended up breaking, breaking the contract. Rome, I think, is very much to blame for this, uh, starting the Second Punic War. And it gave Hannibal his reason. And Hannibal had been training for this his whole life. Uh, his father had died um, in a skirmish, a small little skirmish. They were subduing. They were in New Carthage in Spain. Okay, so Carthage obviously is modern-day Tunisia. But uh, uh, Hasdrubal took his family, um, Hannibal and his brothers, and uh, they went to Spain, New Carthage. And, and Hasdrubal began expanding Carthaginian power in Spain, conquering all the Iberians and, and Gauls, and trying to unify Spain under Carthaginian rule. 
and uh, becoming very powerful. And so once war broke out, I mean, Hannibal, <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable, not just in warfare, but engineering, right? The guy just, um, you know, he brought elephants to, to battle. And he actually designed it's also just like how do you how do you transport elephants across water? You know, across rivers. So Hannibal had to figure this stuff out. Right? He had to figure out engineering stuff like transporting elephants across, building rafts. He took his army through the Alps in the winter. And that <laughs> that is insane. Okay, everyone knows in the ancient world, okay, when winter comes, war stops. Nobody wants to fight war in the winter, right? That's why, you know, March. Why do we call our month March, right? This is pretty much, this is, we're now in spring, and, and uh, this is when spring is, you know, obviously the... the this is where winter turns to spring. But why do we call it March? It's because this is the god of war. Right? Mars. March. And when you go to war, you go in the spring. You go in the month of March. Right? And I think this is also why when the armies go, they say March. Right? Because the armies go in March. March. Go. It's the, the French verb marcher, it's the, uh, to walk, to go, or not to go, to walk, okay? And so war, you, you don't go to war in the winter. Hannibal, crazy, went to war in the winter, took his army of mercenaries, took his Carthaginian army, and the main Carthaginian government, they didn't approve of this. He was just doing this. As like a renegade from New Carthage, from Spain. <sighs> Anyways, crossed the Alps, went into Italy in the middle of winter, didn't care. Lost a lot of his men, lost a lot of his elephants. It was a hell of a gamble. But I mean, you look at his victories. I mean, the guy was insane. The guy was a genius. Right, look at the, the Lake Tresamine. <laughs> Hannibal lured them into an ambush. I also think that like at night time, he was the kind of guy, he would set up fake camps, right? Set up fake campfires. Get all his men, okay, set up all these campfires. Light these fires. Leave some guys to man them to keep the fuel going. Meanwhile, the real army is marching, you know, five miles away from this position, waiting for the... You know, it's... The guy was insane. 25,000 Romans died at Lake Tresemine in that ambush. Right? The, the biggest... Biggest ambush, or the biggest uh, Roman defeat, I think, in history. Never before seen. I think we're talking between 65 to 80,000 Roman soldiers dead in one battle. Think of that number. That is, <laughs> I mean, I think, what did, what did we have for Normandy? The invasion of Normandy? Like what? Two, three thousand? Was it on, on Omaha Beach? Just, it's, it's like, we're talking 80,000 Romans, 65 to 80,000 Romans dead in one battle. And absolute genius. Right? What did Hannibal do at the Battle of Cannae? Battle of Cannae. He, he was completely outnumbered. He knew his cavalry was better. He knew his cavalry was better. And he knew that his cavalry could, could rout the other cavalry. All right. He knew that his cavalry was superior to the Romans. But he let the infantry collide. And what Hannibal did at Cannae was pure genius. He put his veteran soldiers in the center and pushed them forward. And he let the armies collide. 
And while his cavalry was chasing away the Roman cavalry, defeating them, he, he knew that. He said, you, the, this, whole, this whole maneuver depended on his cavalry winning and his cavalry running back. to After you defeat the Roman cavalry, you have to run back. So this entire, like I said to you, in another, one of the, the other videos is whoever has the cavalry is going to determine the battle. And here's another great example of that. So as the infantry have collided, his veteran soldiers were all trained for this. They were all prepared for this maneuver. And the maneuver was start to fall back. The moment the moment you collide, have your center slowly pull back. Okay, you fight, you fight, you fight, and it's very, this is so calculated. And what ends up happening is as the Romans are pushing forward, his center begins to, is, is appearing to retreat. Okay, but what they're actually doing is they're forming a circle. They're surrounding the Romans. And then once the Romans, they, and they don't even realize it, the Romans think that they're pushing the Carthaginians back, that they're starting to retreat. Meanwhile, they're being surrounded. And then at the very end, once the, the Roman infantry is completely surrounded by the Carthaginians, they've, they've pu pu pulled them back enough, the cavalry comes, strikes from behind, and it's just an all-out Roman slaughter. Right? So how did, how did Hannibal... How did he win every battle and then lose the war. How is it the Romans are losing, losing, losing? And then, through all their losses, they end up the victors. So I'm going to say that the Romans' strength was administration, organization. They were persistent. Maybe slow learners, but once they learned, they got it. They, they, the Romans had to learn the hard way. But once they did, they understood and there was no stopping them after. <sighs> so among these, vic these defeats, there was a young Roman, Scipio Africanus, who was studying, learning. And then he applied... Everything he learned from Hannibal, he's now going to throw it back in Hannibal's face and use all their tactics against the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians' tactics against himself, against you know them. So Scipio, I think he was the youngest, the youngest Roman in history. I think he was like thirty. 30 years old or maybe not even he wasn't even old enough to be consul and I think he was the first Roman in history who was too young to have you know these key positions in the Roman Senate but was still given command of a Roman army I don't think it had ever happened before in Roman history and so Scipio used all of, of Hannibal's war strategies against him. Right? When Hannibal sent his elephants in, well, Scipio remembered what happened the last time. The men panicked, and the elephants just slaughtered the men, trampled them. But this time when the elephants came in, the men formed very nice organized columns, divided exactly when the, where the elephants were, and then just threw their javelins, speared them all down, and the elephants were absolutely useless when uh, the Romans met them again the next time. So, the Romans were always learning from their defeats. And they had the greatest teacher of all, Hannibal Barca, Right? Bark is also where we get the name Barcelona, the great city in Spain. Barcelona is named after this Hebrew word, Barak, lightning. 
named after the Barkide family. So, when the two generals finally met for the first time, both undefeated generals, Hannibal never lost a battle, Scipio never lost a battle, and uh, they met now for the first time. I mean, the odds that Hannibal didn't take Rome is, is like unbelievable. The guy spent like almost 20 years, at least 15 years, in Roman territory and like Rome was done like the odds Rome would survive were just one in one in a hundred what are the odds they did they persevered and they learned from their enemies every defeat there was a lesson to be learned and when the two generals met at Zama the Battle of Zama on Carthaginian territory well only one of these generals was going to remain undefeated. And against, well, at this point, it was, the odds were against Hannibal at this point. And Hannibal had created a monster. And legend says, I don't know if this was really happened, I don't know if this was really said, spoken between them, but apparently the two generals met before the battle. And apparently Hannibal said to Scipio, Don't forget that I created you. And Scipio apparently looked back and replied to him and said, You didn't create me, but you did, you did cause me to be. And now I will beat you. Now, I don't know if that probably, that probably didn't happen. But it would be really cool if it did. I can only imagine... If they did actually meet before the battle, you can only imagine what was said between these two great, great, you know, military strategists. Probably the two greatest in history. Now again, Hannibal was the real genius, but Scipio was learning, paying attention, learning from his defeats, and that's you know, what I would say to you. Um, we have to learn from our defeats. And, you know, when I was a little kid, uh, me and my brothers were really good chess players. We were the best in, uh, among the best in the country, best in our city, best in our province for our ages. Um, and, uh, I was so good at chess when I was little that I couldn't play kids. I, I had to play in adult chess tournaments. And the only reason we were good at chess, um, was because, um, my mother, I had a single mom with four kids and she couldn't afford to put us in sports. Um, so she bought us a chess board that was cheaper. So we just played chess. And, um, anyways, uh, so me and my brothers got really good. My older brother was so good. He was actually almost a chess master. Uh, he was like, his rating was 2100. So he was just like a couple hundred points shy of being a chess master. Uh, but he was only 10, 11 years old, right? So, I mean, he was playing in chess tournaments across the country and winning and destroying. We, we were all like that. No, but not, not like my older brother. My older brother was particularly uh, gifted at chess. But my point is, uh, I used to just slaughter my opponents, especially like the kids just slaughter them there was no challenge so again I was playing I had to play against adults and I remember one adult chess tournament my little brother and me um, this is like a you know rated in Canada we have it's called the CFC Canada Chess Federation um, and so this is like you know rated 
you could, you know, my, my games are on the archives there. Uh, and this, we're, me and my brother were against these, another set of brothers actually, twins. Um, twin brothers, they were in their 20s. I was eight at the time, my brother would have been six. And chess tournament, rated chess tournament. And, uh, both me and my brother were losing, right? And I didn't care. I didn't, I wouldn't, you know, I, I might win one game out of five. I wasn't some great chess player. I was good for an eight-year-old that I can only play against adults. So, anyways, what happened was, uh, I remember I got up from my board, went and saw my mom was really upset. And what happened was, the, when I went over to talk to her, she said that, oh, the, that jerk that's playing your little brother, the brother of the guy you're playing, he just told me his strategy on how he's going to beat your little brother. He said that he's just letting the clock tick. Because I think we each have two hours, I forgot, two or three hours for the game on each, on each side of the clock. And because my little brother's only six and the chess tournament was in the evening, he was just letting his clock, and my brother was falling asleep. So he was laughing, this 20, 20 something year old adult is laughing that he's putting it, he's beating his opponent by using time to put him to sleep. <laughs> and I was so pissed, but something that awoke in me in that moment was I realized, oh, well, you could break the rules without breaking the rules, right? There's no law in chess that says you can't let your clock go to put your opponent to sleep, right? That's not in the rules of chess. There's nothing saying you can't do that. All right. So then, so then when I, it, something kind of opened in my head there that uh, you don't have to play by the rules. You, you play by the rules without playing by the rules. Right? You could bend them. So, when I was playing the, the guy's brother, now I was, like, determined to win. I wanted revenge for what this guy's brother was doing to my little brother. And I now had this, you know, I'll try to find the, the chest. But if you look at the board, right, I, I found a checkmate. I found a way I could defeat my opponent. But if I play it, right, the, the, I can't let him see what I'm planning, right? But if I play this move, it's so obvious. It's so obvious once I drop the piece that there's no way he's not going to see it. And if he sees it, I'm done. If I can trick him, then I'll win. All right. So what do I do? Well, I'm just some dumb little kid, right? So I know now how the, the game works in tournament rules. If you touch the piece, you have to move it. If you let go of the piece, that's your move. There's no going back, right? So I made sure that I touched the piece and I made sure that the moment I let go of that piece, because if you look at the game, it doesn't make sense. Anyone could see this is a trick. Don't, right? So I'm going to give this guy my queen. I'm going to say the queen is the most powerful most valuable piece on the board next to the king, right? You don't want to lose your queen. <laughs> when you lose your queen, you know, you're down a queen, good chance you're going to lose the game. Anyways, so, I, when I let go of the piece, I made sure that I was extra sad. I just screamed, no, no, oh, let me take it back, please. Please, oh no, I didn't mean to let go, it was an accident. And I beg this guy, a little kid, eight-year-old kid, please, sir, I, I didn't mean to let go. And just like his brother was just this 
jerk. He looked at me with a smirk, you know? You stupid kid. And he says, no, that's your move. And then he goes to write down the move. Right? Because we're writing down our moves. It's tournament tournament chess. You have to write, write down your moves. And he says, I'm going to give that move a double question mark. It's a double question mark. Now, in chess, if you write question mark down, it means bad move. If you write double question mark down, well, that means a very bad move. All right. So he wrote, writes down double question mark, bad move, and uh, then I stopped, you know, I stopped crying. I wasn't sad all of a sudden. He took my queen, and in a moment, my crocodile tears, my sadness turned into this just sinister smirk of joy. And I took my rook, my castle, and I slammed it on the other side of the board. And I looked that <laughs> that man in the eye. And I said, well, if that was a double question mark, then this is a double exclamation mark. <laughs> Okay, you figure it out. If, you know, que double question marks are a really bad move, it means double exclamation marks are a really good move. And that guy just sat there looking at the board <laughs> in total shock. In total shock that he fell for it. And had he ignored my performance, my entire strategy, if you were to look at this chess game move for move it doesn't make sense if you were there no one would take that queen nobody anyone who looked at this chess game would know don't touch that queen okay who who would do that who would just give you that stupid that queen it's just too too it's too good to be true don't buy it well this guy did and the only reason he bought it because on the other side of the board was a crying little boy begging for mercy who he just ignored. I'm not giving you mercy, you dumb, stupid kid. Well, he should have. Right? All he had to do was go, no problem, little boy. I'll let you take that back. And then I would have been screwed. I would have, I would have, no, 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 no. Like, I, need you, I, need, I need that there. <laughs> no. Let me tell you, it was a sweet victory. And I felt like I, you know, I definitely cheered my mom up. And uh, I don't know if my little brother remembers that. But what happened to me later that year? Right? Well, for the first time ever, I went to a chess tournament, right, to go to the provincials. So this is like the regionals or whatever. And I've never lost a chess tournament. Kids can't beat me. <laughs> I'm the best. I'm undefeated. I'm Hannibal. <laughs> right? I'm the Jews. Victory after victory after victory. No one can stop me. No one can defeat me. I'm the best. Well, what happened? See, I never practiced. I never, and I'll be honest, I didn't really care about chess. I was the, I was the little kid. My, my older brother studied like crazy. I liked, I didn't want to play chess. I wanted to grow up to be a chess piece. I wanted to be in the battles. I wanted to be a soldier. I wanted to fight. I wanted to get shot at. I wanted to get blown up. I wanted action. I just was addicted to this my whole life. So I didn't want to play chess. I wanted to be a chess piece. So I didn't really practice. I didn't really care. But I'll tell you something. Those kids that I used to smash, those kids who stood no chance against me, those kids who never beat me a single time, what happened this year when I went to the regionals? 
I barely made the playoffs. Kids that I had been slaughtering for two, three years, kids who I never imagined would ever, ever beat me in a game of chess. I never practiced, I didn't need to. I won every battle, won every game. <laughs> well, this regionals, I barely made the playoffs. I, I barely made it. And guess what happened when I got to the playoffs? Right? I think like eight of us get in, and then it's like, it's, it's just, it's do or die. It's you lose, you're out. Um, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, because this is, to, this is to get into the provincials. This is to go to Toronto and play, you know, at, uh, at a provincial than national level. And I lost the first game in the playoffs. I was out. I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't make the top five. I was, I just cried. I cried like a little baby because for the first time ever in my life, my opponents had been writing down our games from the year before. My opponents spent the whole year studying everything, everything. And <laughs> I got slaughtered in the regionals and, uh, um, by kids that I just never thought could ever beat me. And it's because they were paying attention, right? And I was cocky and I was arrogant. I was using the same tricks that always worked for me, but they'd figured out my tricks. They're like the Romans. They started building corvuses. They, they stole my ship designs. They added these corvuses to the ships they stole from me. They put Marines on their ships to slaughter, jump onto my ships and kill me. They figured out what I did to them at Tresemine. They figured out what I did to them at Cani. Right? They were paying attention. I wasn't. I was teaching them the whole time how to beat me. And then they did without mercy. And I didn't see it coming. I was, again, I didn't even make it. I made it to the playoffs and I was out the first round in the playoffs against the kid that I had beat a hundred times before. Never imagined this kid would beat me. Never. And, uh, that was it. <laughs> so, your enemies are always teaching you how to beat them. You just have to listen. Right? So how do Jews go into a city and a hundred years later they own the city? Well, they have some rules. Right? They have some rules. When they come into a city, now things have changed for the Jews. They're not the same as it was, you know, two, three hundred years ago. Uh, before Jews had laws against them, they couldn't be in government politics. Uh, wasn't even that long ago in Russia, they were confined to the Pale of Settlements, which it's not a ghetto. It's, it was like a big portion of the Russian Empire. Uh, they were limited to how many Jews can go to university. Um, uh, there, there, there were different laws for Jews in France and England and. I mean, the first uh, British politician, I think, was Rothschild in 1848. So just, you know, a hundred and less than 200 years ago, right? Uh, so, so Jews would come into your country and uh, uh, they would only buy from each other. They were very... Um, discipline. We let others buy from us, but we don't buy from anyone but ourselves, but each other. We keep the money in our circle. We let them. So what happens now is if you develop this discipline where you let others buy from you, but you don't buy from anyone else, what's going to happen? 
Why do Jews like to give other Jews business? Because they know that most of that money is going to stay in the Jewish community. And they know that the Jewish business that they, the Jew that they invest in, is also donating 10% of their, uh, 10% of their income is going, is going to the Jewish community. So, number one, they keep the money in their circle. Number two, they have a hub. They have a headquarters to manage that circle. That's what a synagogue is. Okay? Now, the word synagogue is a Greek word. It means an assembly. It's strictly Greek word. I have no idea why Jews call their, their Knesset, their Sanhedrin, their group, their... I don't know why they call it a synagogue. It's a strictly Greek word. So now they have their hub, and all the Jews are contributing 10%. But you know what the rabbis can also do? It's going back 200 years ago. They can then say, you know what? We're, we, need, we need 50%. We need, we need all Jews to pull together right now because we're going to buy this brewery. We're going to buy this alcohol still. We're going to buy this newspaper. And the Jews are going to buy a thriving business. They're going to put all their money together through their community. And then they're going to buy this successful company, fire everybody, replace everyone with Jews, maybe do it over time, right? And then they're going to pool their money together. When they need to build houses for each other, they're not going to go to a bank. They're not going to go borrow money at compounded interest to buy a home for a fellow Jew. Of course not. They don't do that to each other. They're going to work as a community. See, we can't do that. Do you, do you know how easy it is for us, you know, to get out of debt? Do you know how little we would have to donate? Like, imagine if, like, you're living in, I don't know, I forgot what the population was of, I think my province, let's just, let's just say for argument's sake, my province, Quebec, let's just say there's 10 million people even. Let's just say that everybody donates 50 cents. Let's just pretend every month we have to sacrifice 50 cents for each other. All right? Every month. Is 50 cents a lot? Can you afford 50 cents? Can your girlfriend afford 50 cents? Can your kids, can they sacrifice 50 cents? Let's just sacrifice 50 cents. That's... that's that's five million dollars a month if everyone in the province sacrificed 50 cents a month to go to a fund to start constructing homes and apartments to be sold at value with no interest to ensure all of us get a home right five million a month how many homes can you build in a month five million dollars every month boom 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 and then you sell those at value, right? And you attach no interest to it. There's no, so every, every penny the person puts down, that's what they pay. What's stopping us from doing that? From building our circle up? What's stopping us from starting a tax-free church? Right? And uh, fighting back. Right? Nothing's stopping us. You know what's stopping us? We're incapable of working for each other. We're incapable. We're not, we, we can't think like Jews. We're so selfish and greedy and divided. <laughs> We're going to start fighting over leadership and who gets to control the, the $5 million a month. Right? It's not going to be about building homes. Sorry, I can't see if my phone's still working. Anyways. Nothing's stopping us from learning from our enemies. 
nothing ourselves. Anyways, sorry. So what's stopping us from working together? What's stopping us from pooling our money together? You know, what's 50 cents a month? If we all just disciplined ourselves, 50 cents a month, everyone in my province, 10 million people, 50 cents. 10 million, that's $5 million a month, right? And when you build these homes, you build them with the youth, free education. So all these kids are gonna learn how to pour foundations, right? How to pour cement, drywall, right? They're gonna learn electrical, plumbing, for free. You're not gonna charge them. You're gonna teach them valuable skills. And you're gonna create a labor force, guys that you can pull from. Then you're gonna sell them these mortgage-free houses, mortgage-free apartments, right? At cost. Nothing's stopping us. It's not, a, it's not illegal. <laughs> What's stopping us is we're selfish. We're, we can't work together. I've tried. I've tried. <laughs> right? It's maybe through suffering, right? Maybe now we're going to learn how to work together. But nothing was ever stopping us. Nothing, that's how the Jews can just walk into your community and why they're going to slaughter you is because they work together. They sacrifice for each other. They push their fellow Jew up. They don't kick them down, right? When I was in army cadets, my God, I didn't have to worry about my enemies. My enemies were not the people who took me down. The people who, who took me down and destroyed my army cadet career, my best friends, my best friends took me down, right? The officers were looking for a reason not to promote me. They didn't have one. My best friend gave him one. And what was terrible was I had 10 reasons, you know, <laughs> that I could have given the officers not to promote these people. I kept all their secrets to myself. Never once, not even after they blabbed, gave the officers a reason not to promote me. I kept my mouth shut. Wasn't gonna stoop to their level. We just can't work together. And until you can learn from your defeats, you know, look at usury, look at compounded interest paper money. Everyone wants to return to a gold standard or silver standard. Let's go. Are you crazy? Do you know what the ancient, uh, the, the money was in ancient Rome? <laughs> Lumps of copper. I want you to think about ancient Rome. They were a farming community. They didn't have precious gold. They didn't have silver in their mountains. They didn't have copper like a giant amounts of copper mines and silver mines. They didn't, they were farmers. The most powerful empire in the world was built by farmers. <laughs> Guys selling wine and cattle and grain. That's where the most powerful empire in the world came from. Farmers. That's how governments are started. They're started when farmers come together and say, okay, this is, this is my land, that's your land, right? They come together, and every year they bring their goods together, right? And then they exchange stock, right? That's why we call it a stock exchange. You go to the stock exchange, right? It's farming, right? Now it's, you know, it's, you think of stock exchange, you think of NASDAQ, you think of computers, and all this other stuff. But stock exchange, farmers, Right? And then the farmers come together, they have to now establish their boundaries, their borders. Okay, we guys, we need rules, we need laws. Okay, we have to pool a certain percentage of our wealth side. We need to hire guards to patrol our lands, police. Right? We need this, we need that. And uh, on, on every farm, every Roman villa, on every farmstead, 
there was, what? There were blacksmiths, right? Work with metal, tanners, work with leather, right? They had carpenters, guys to work with wood, and etc. right? And within that farmstead, there was all this industry. And that's, it's through farming that you get government, right? And the, the landowners would have all their employees, their workers, carpenters, smiths. And then the landowners would meet together, talk about law, rules, regulations, go to the stock exchange. And this is where government comes from. Farmers. Rome. And in ancient Rome and ancient Greece, you couldn't be part of the government unless you were a soldier. You couldn't vote unless you served in the army. At least you're part of the community, communitas. It's not about turning 18 years old and now you can vote. No. So, in early Rome, copper was their currency. And I think there was a Roman senator, I don't know if he was a senator, there was a Roman politician, leader, landowner. Uh, his name was Curious Detontus, something like this. And I think it was during the, just before the Roman Carthaginian War, uh, there was this, the Roman Samnite Wars. And this, uh, the, Rome had to, Rome was against gold and silver currency. They hated you. You were looked down upon if you traded in gold and silver. You're right. Because they traded in lumps of of copper. All right, so this Roman senator, he was being bribed with silver or gold. And is quoted in saying, I consider gold a fine thing to possess but I consider ruling and controlling those who have it to be even finer. <laughs> Why would you want gold when you can control the people who have it? So early Rome ran off copper and they shunned anyone. And why? It's because copper was abundant. Gold and silver are easily, are easily, you know, you can manipulate them. So anyways, anyways, I'd, uh, what I've learned from my enemies is compounded interest is a weapon that's actually quite easy to destroy with self-discipline. I've learned that you don't need gold or silver <laughs> to build your country. The greatest empire in the world, the most powerful Sorry, you know the greatest empire in the world. The most powerful empire. The one we built in this last hundred years. The greatest advancements in the history of mankind. This world we're living in today was built with fake money. Paper money. Money that represented debt. We don't need to return to a gold standard. My enemies have taught me that as long as people trust their government <laughs> you don't need to run your country off gold and silver you don't yeah they took us off the gold and silver standard and they probably robbed Fort Knox blind robbed the World Trade Center blind took all our gold and silver but who cares about gold and silver I would rather control those who have it. <laughs> that is a finer thing. So, anyways, we have to learn from our mistakes. Our enemies are always teaching us how to beat them. We have to learn to work together, sacrifice for each other, and, uh, um, 
yeah, uh, listen to your enemy. I don't know, uh, don't know if I'm gonna, how, when I'm gonna finish this series. I think I have to take more time off and just focus uh, on rebuilding what little remains of my life. Um, try to salvage my mental health and um, just, you know, with me, uh, unfortunately, with every video I produce, you know, when I started making videos, uh, I was, life was much more comfortable, more simple. I had every necessity a man needed to stay healthy, stay focused. And I had friends, I had a family, I had a girlfriend, I, I, uh, I had a country to fight for and since I started making videos just one by one, I lost my friends, lost my family, girlfriend, and lost my country. And I'll tell you, it's a lot harder to charge into battle when you don't have anything to fight for anymore. So, with every video I upload, it's just becomes more and more depressing for me. And right now I have to focus on just stabilizing, stabilizing my life and figuring myself out. Anyways, just a rant. Hope you guys are well. And uh, yeah, I don't know when I'll upload again.